When Moses struck the rock, and then he struck that rock the second time, and God said, you won't enter into the promised land because you struck that rock twice. That didn't make any sense until you understand that that rock was Christ. He was only going to be struck once. Father, we bless you today. We worship you. Thank you, Lord, that you renew our strength. Father, I thank you right now that we mount up on wings as eagles. Father, I thank you for the strength that you provide for us. And we glorify you and we magnify you in it. Thank you, Father, that we can walk in that strength and in that, in that great goodness that you provided for us every day of our lives. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Listen, when you sing that song, that waiting is not waiting in line at McDonald's. You know, or in my case, waiting for Becky to go somewhere. The word there, waiting, actually means to minister to the Lord. It actually means, if you really get into it, to be entwined with Him. And so, if you're going to wait on the Lord, you've got to have communication with Him. You've got to have fellowship with Him. You've got to have relationship with Him. And so, when you sing that and you want the strength of the Lord, it's not this, okay, Lord, I'm waiting. No. It's when you're worshiping, when you're fellowshipping, when you make him part of your life in a greater way than you ever have. That's waiting on the Lord. Sure, part of that's just waiting on him in prayer, just getting in and in, in worshiping God and praying. You'd be amazed at what can happen when you do that. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. <coughs> we're, we're in a series this summer, this latter part of the summer, on Ephesians. And today we're in the third chapter of Ephesians, and I'm not going to take it verse by verse. I've got one particular point out of this chapter that has helped me, I mean, immensely. And so uh, out of that, I want to share that with you. So I'm going to read a portion of, of Scripture here in Ephesians chapter 3, and then we're going to, we're going to talk about this, this portion of Scripture. Now, I may cough today, but it's not COVID-related, so please don't panic, okay? I, everything's okay. Thank you. Ephesians chapter, one, ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, now, that's important, okay, which was given to me for you. Now, listen to this, that, I, that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have already briefly written, already, uh, have, as I, he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, <coughs> excuse me, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, for some reason, my, um, my, there we go. Which in the ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been revealed by the Spirit to the holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ through the gospel, <clears throat> of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me who am least of less of the saints, that this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. Now, listen to me carefully, okay? <clears throat> if you understand what I just read to you, 
you understand that we're living in a time today that from the beginning of time was a hidden mystery. It was a secret. It was not revealed until the apostles and the prophets got the revelation of it about what Jesus did for you and I. Sometimes we don't understand this, but I'm going to explain it to you. <clears throat> Paul talked about the dispensation of grace. He said that's the dispensation that we're living in now. It was given to me by revelation to give to you. Now, let me back up so you'll understand this. This is a little Bible lesson that will help you. A dispensation <clears throat> is real simple. It's a time frame in which God works with man in a certain way. Okay? And there are actually uh, seven of these time frames that God works with man. First of all was the age of innocence. That's when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they knew no evil. How would you like to be there? That would be nice, wouldn't it? Because then you wouldn't have to worry about the reports about COVID, war. You wouldn't have, hey, you, you'd be innocent. Well, we're not innocent anymore, are we? No, we have the knowledge now of what? Good and evil. So after that, and after Adam transgressed <coughs> till the flood, there was a time of conscience. In other words, every man lived by his own conscience. Terrible time, dangerous time, because it showed what man with his own conscience could do and how he could live, and it wasn't pretty. Then there was Noah to Abraham, which was human government. In other words, the, uh, the governments that were, that were set in place ruled and reigned and told people what to do. Then you've got Abraham. <clears throat> Thank God for Abraham. Amen. And that, that was a time of promise where God dealt with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob according to the Word of God, according to the promises that he made. And then came Moses and the law. And for, <coughs> excuse me, 1,500 years, the law prevailed. But then here comes Jesus. Woo, thank God for Jesus. Jesus came. And he fulfilled the law. He died so that you and I might live. That he bore our sin in his own body for us. That we might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came. And so for a period now, so far up to 2,000 years, <coughs> we have lived in this wonderful place called the dispensation of grace. And that's what Paul was revealing to the church. Say, well, pastor, that's only six. I know there's another one. And, it, and, and it's coming after the end of this dispensation, which I believe we're at the end of it. According to Hosea, we're at the end of it. As he said, after 2,000 years, then there's going to there's gonna become a, a reviving, a, a being in the presence of the Lord forever. Well, we're, we're, we're there. You say, well, our calendar may be wrong. Well, it's not that wrong. I mean, we're, we're in that time frame right now. I don't know when it is, but there will come a time when Jesus is coming back. And he's not coming back just to take the saints out in the rapture. He's coming back on a white horse, and he's coming back in vengeance. And when that is over, and it's only a seven-year period, period of time. Actually, most scholars believe it's only three and a half years. Okay, uh, don't worry. If you're serving Jesus, I believe you'll already be in heaven with Him. Okay, so and if you're not, the Bible says God didn't appoint us to wrath, so we'll be okay. Okay, so listen. So <clears throat> that millennial period will be a thousand years with Jesus reigning on the earth. Okay, that's the last dispensation. <clears throat> After that's over, then we're going to live for, with God forever. And he'll start really fulfilling all the plans that he had for us in the beginning with Adam and Eve. 
Well, that wasn't my message, but it's good preaching anyway. Okay. So in this grace time, God has revealed his true purpose uh, that he planned but had hidden since the beginning of time. Listen, when God said it's finished in the beginning and he said it was good, he already had a plan for everything. He didn't intend for Adam and Eve to transgress, but they did. He had a plan. He had a plan. I'm going to show you from the Word today. And so you have to understand and realize <clears throat> that, that this, was, this mystery that was exposed was the mystery of Christ. And when you read in the New Testament, especially in Ephesians, about the mystery, it's not like our mysteries that have to be solved the word there in the Greek text is the word mysterion. It actually means something that was hidden that has been revealed. And so it's been revealed through the apostles and the prophets, the Word of God says, this great mystery of Christ that in other ages was not made known. So for 4,000 years, <coughs> nobody understood. Nobody understood. But then Jesus came. And then the revelation by the Apostle Paul and the rest of the apostles and the prophets began to reveal, well, here's the plan of God. Here's the purpose of God. Here's the understanding that you can live your life by and walk by as a believer in Jesus and live the life he has for you. It wasn't made known. But listen to what it says in Ephesians 3, 6. And, and I think this will help you. That the Gentiles, all right, here it is. That the Gentiles, that's you. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Okay, there are only two races in Christ. The Jew and the Gentile. Okay, so he said, listen, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Okay, let me read you an, uh, another translation, the message translation. Paul said this, My task is to bring out in open, make plain what God, who created all things in the first place, has been doing in secret behind the scenes all along. Since the beginning of time, working behind the scenes, Listen to the, uh, the New Living Translation says this. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. So you need to understand that this dispensation that we live in, this wonderful grace that we live in, has not been here very long. And even the revelation of it is still coming alive. It was a mystery that was hidden in God from the beginning of time. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says, It was ordained before the ages for our glory. <coughs> Excuse me. For our glory. Isn't that awesome? Now, now listen to the next verse, verse 8. I like this. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the devil had known what he was releasing, he would never have crucified Jesus. It would have been much better for Jesus just to have lived on the earth, did miracles wherever he was, lived the life that he lived on the earth where he was at the time and the devil to know where he was at any given time than for Jesus to be crucified and by doing so be multiplied. So if they'd have known what they were getting into, I promise you the devil... In every power of darkness, they would have never crucified him. But see, it was hidden. It was a mystery. It was a secret. Even the Pharisees, they argued continually about Jesus. Jesus, on one hand, was fulfilling the hidden secrets, and they were exposed 
because he was living it, but on the other hand, they couldn't see it because it was still hidden. It was still a, a mystery <coughs> until it was over. In fact, it even goes further back than that. Listen to what 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning of verse 10 says. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories which were to follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering these things which have now been reported to you through those, now listen to this, who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Now let me just give you a real quick rundown, real quick, so you can understand what I'm saying here. Listen to this. The prophets prophesied, and I'm going to show you this in a minute from the Word of God, prophesied continually about this strange time, this time of grace. This, this, this time they didn't understand. They prophesied about one to come that they didn't understand. And they cried out to God, God, what is this? What is this? Show me, show me. And they got a revelation. And the revelation was, it's not for you. It's for us. It was not for you. It was for us. Even the angels marveled at all the prophecy and all the words that were given about this Son of God, this Christ, this Messiah that was going to come. But they had no understanding of it. They had no clue of what was going to take place. Can you imagine the angels' perspective at the crucifixion and the resurrection and all of a sudden, oh, this is what this has all been about. For thousands of years, we've wondered. We've wondered why, why the Father, why, why He was to having these prophecies and this and this. And we didn't understand them. Oh, we, we're just doing what we're told. You know, the angels hearken to the Word of God. That's all. <coughs> Amen. And so they didn't understand. Then all of a sudden, right before their eyes, all this stuff started coming to pass. But it wasn't for them. It was for us. It wasn't for them to understand. It wasn't for them to receive. It was for us. Paul, in Ephesians here, we're talking about in chapter 3, Paul received and revealed the mystery that was kept secret since the foundation of the world. When you're reading Paul's letters, you're reading Revelation that was unknown. Unknown. A hundred years before him, that. Really less than that, but just, so, just to cover my bases because I don't know the exact time. For eternity, it was unknown. Paul and John and Peter and James, they got the Revelation of, of what was actually taking place. Let me explain this to you. Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Nobody understood that. They could not understand that. They couldn't pick, they couldn't perceive that. They couldn't understand that. They had no clue what that meant. But you do. Why? Because it's been revealed. The, pro the prophets sought to understand how is it that God tells Eve that her seed is going to bruise the head of the serpent, Satan. Women don't have seed, they have eggs. 
little biological <laughs> lesson there. But yet, they didn't understand what that meant. They had no clue. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, if you look at it today, you understand because there was no seed involved. There was no man involved. The seed was God. The seed was the Word of God. They didn't understand that. They couldn't understand how, how that could happen. <coughs> Over in Genesis chapter 22, God was talking to Abraham. He said, you gave your son, your only son. And because you were willing to give your son, your only son, your seed is going to bless the world. Now, I'm paraphrasing. Your seed is going to bless the world. They didn't understand what it was. They thought it was talking about the children of Israel. They thought that all he was talking about was the seed of, uh, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the promises were them. They didn't know the seed God was talking about was not a multitude, but one, and his name was Jesus. They didn't understand that. There was no revelation of that. There was no comprehension of that. Why? Because the Gentiles were never included in anything they didn't think. They didn't understand that God was going to transfer the promises of the seed of Abraham to anyone who believed. Galatians 3.29 says, If you be in Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. They didn't understand that. They had no clue. There was no revelation of it. It was a mystery hidden from the foundation of it. But the whole time, God was working. God was working. He was working His plan. And it was done in secret. And the prophets prophesied it because the Word of God had to go forth. Moses didn't realize that the deliverance of the children of uh, Israel from Egypt was a type of the deliverance from the world. They didn't understand that when they took that lamb and they ate that lamb, that that was the lamb of God that was going to be sacrificed for them. His name was Jesus. They didn't understand that that blood that they put over the doorpost was the blood of Jesus that would be put over our hearts to deliver us from the sin of the world. They didn't understand any of that. But the whole time, God was working. God's plan was being set up. God's plan was being designed. When Moses struck the rock, and then he struck that rock the second time, and God said, you won't enter into the promised land because you struck that rock twice. That didn't make any sense until you understand that that rock was Christ. And he was only going to be struck once didn't understand it. What does that mean? What you, you know, God was pretty hard on Moses. Moses really did a lot. I mean, he really, all Moses did was get mad and hit the rock again. Yeah, but the problem was that rock was Christ. In fact, the Bible says it was a rock that followed them. They didn't understand any of that. But you do. When they lifted up that bronze serpent in the wilderness, and, the, and, and it said, whoever looks upon that serpent will be healed. They didn't understand that there was coming one who was going to be lifted up. And whoever believed on him, whoever looked unto him, whoever accepted him would be delivered and salvation would be theirs. They didn't understand that. It was a secret. It was a mystery. It was hidden. But now it's revealed. They didn't understand that the children of Israel stood at the, 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 the waters of the promised land but didn't go across because of unbelief. They didn't enter into the promised land. They didn't enter into rest. <coughs> they didn't understand that because of that, God was now going to allow anybody who accepted Jesus to enter into that rest, to enter into that promised land. Didn't understand it. Didn't have a clue what it meant. <clears throat> but you do. You know. All the Levitical law of sacrifice pointed to one, listen, 
to one sacrifice, and that was Jesus. One sacrifice. All, I mean, you read about the thousands and thousands of animals that were slaughtered for their blood just to protect and atone for sin for a year. All that was was a representation of the one who was going to come and shed his blood once and for all for humanity and anyone who would walk underneath that blood and accept it and, and receive forgiveness of sin. They didn't understand any of that. It was a mystery to them. It's not to us. It's not to us. All of history, God was planning. All of history, God was working. All the time, God was working. Now, this is going to shock some of you, but, but, but David spoke of Jesus and not being left in hell. Some people think, well, Jesus just died and laid in the tomb for three days and was raised from the dead. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, it says, you will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Where do you get that from? From, from the prophet, from David. I'll tell you, if you want to go a little further, you can go read over in Psalm 22 and find out about the agony of hell itself and the suffering of it. It all was there. It was just all hidden. Then you find that he's seated, he, God seats him at the right hand of glory. It's in the Old Testament. It's there. Seated at the right hand of God. It's there. But they couldn't see it. But we can see it. We understand it. We know it. Isaiah, the great messianic prophet, would have loved to look into the things that you and I know. You just think about this for a moment. Listen to Isaiah 7, 14. Listen. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Virgin conceive. Wait a minute, Lord. Hold it now. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Are you sure about that? The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He didn't understand what he was saying. He saw God. God, what does this virgin thing mean? How is that going to work? How are you going to do that? Well, we know how it worked. We know because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. And that thing that was born of her, the Bible said, was holy. It was a mystery. The whole time, God setting it up, setting the world to come up, the future up. When it says in Isaiah 9, verse 6, that it says that unto you a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Nobody understood that. We do. Over in Isaiah 53, it says in verse 4, Surely He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. We esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. Nobody understood who's going to bear those stripes. Who's going to bear that in themselves? that it might set humanity free. Yet we know that that was Jesus. That he was wounded for me. He was bruised for me. He carried my grief. That word grief there is the word sickness. He carried my sorrow. Nobody understood that. For thousands of years, nobody understood it. But we do. Nobody. Isaiah 50. Four, verse, beginning in verse 8, talks about the great mercy of God. It says, With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your, here it is, Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness 
shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. That's who God is to us. When I see a rainbow, I don't see LBGTQ or whatever it is. I see a promise of mercy and kindness from God. Isaiah 54, 14. Listen, this was such a foreign thing. You may not understand, realize it because you live in it. But listen to what it says in Isaiah 54, verse 14. Listen. In righteousness you shall be established. No man can be righteous. But God said, yes, you can. You shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. For you shall not fear. And from terror. For it shall not come near you. I'm established in righteousness because I made Jesus the Lord of my life. And when I made him the Lord of my life, his righteousness became my righteousness. It gave me liberty. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because of that righteousness I am established. They didn't understand that. Isaiah's probably scratching his head his whole life. Lord, show me, what am I saying? And the Lord said, uh, it's not for you. It's for us. Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesied about a day when God would take the stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. And he would put his spirit on the inside of man so that man no longer lived by the law, but lived by the Holy Spirit on the inside of him and obeyed not because he had to out of fear of a law, but because he felt in his heart that that's the right thing to do by the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand what that meant. But some of you do. I don't know about all of you, but some of you do. I hope all of you. Paul revealed, now listen to this. Paul revealed the mysteries that were held secret in the mind of God since the very beginning. Now, we, we read all the way to verse 9, okay? All right, so now listen to this. Because verse 10 gives us the purpose of God's plan. Listen to what it says. I'm going to read this out of a, of a, <coughs> a, a Weymouth translation, a great translation. Listen to this. It is the stewardship of the truth which from all ages lay concealed in the mind of God, the creator of all things, concealed in order, now listen to this, concealed in order that the church might now, the church might now be used to display to the powers and authorities in the heavenly realm, now listen to this, the innumerable aspects of God's wisdom. This whole thing was done so that the church, not a denomination, not a religious organization, but the body of Christ coming together as a church, might literally might walk in the authority that God has given us to reveal His wisdom, to produce His fruit, His product, His produce. What, are you, what is that? The Word of God, the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, to display like this, to display power and authority in the heavenly realms. See, the kingdom of God is in us. We're not trying to build an earthly kingdom. We're dealing with the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and wicked spirits. That's in another chapter. Yeah. God's given us that authority. And what we've got to do is realize and understand that we're more than just a group of people that come to Sunday morning service and worship. That we're the church. 
And when we make up our mind to do something as a church, I'm going to tell you something, it's going to get done. When we lay aside politics and race and any, any disagreements we might have about anything other than Jesus and Him crucified, and we make up our minds we're going to come together and we're going to see God do something, and we pray together, you're going to see God move. You're going to see God move. <laughs> the Bible says that, that, that Jesus made this great statement in Matthew chapter 16. He said, I am going to build my church. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. He didn't say, Peter, you're going to build my church. This isn't the Roman Catholic church. This is the church of God. I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, see, sometimes people think, well, that means the devil can't get to us. The gates of hell, we're going to, we're going to literally prevail over death. We're not going to let people die and go to hell. That's not going to stop us. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God. We're going to see God move. We're going to declare the goodness of God, the glory of God, the power of God. And when we start seeing that and understanding that, all of a sudden, we're going to become the church. We have been given the revelation, listen to me, of the ages. If you can get your mind off of your little world for just a few minutes this morning, and realize and understand that for 4,000 years, the world was in darkness and didn't understand the plan of God. But God's plan has been exposed. And the purpose is so that the church can be relevant. Not in politics. Relevant in the realm of the Spirit. Listen, if you want to stop people from, from uh, uh, having, you want to stop the city from having murders, you want to, we're going to have to deal with it. And we're not going to deal with it by who we vote for or law and order. We're going to deal with it because we're going to pray and we're going to bind up those spirits that are trying to. You've got to make up your mind. And that, well, pastor, you do it. No, he didn't say the pastors will do it. Said the church. We just got to make up our mind we're going to do it. I know we're not doing it because you have a prayer meeting and you get a handful of people come to church. That's where the work's done. That's where the work's done. Let me put it to you in another perspective. <coughs> Listen to this. God is using approximately six-tenths of one percent of all time to culminate that which has been hidden since the foundation of the earth. Lord, when's this going to happen? Any, any minute. I, I really believe to some degree the Lord's waiting on us. I, I believe I can show you that in the Word. We've got to make up our minds. Are we going to be the church or not? It, for this purpose, all of what I read to you from Ephesians 1 to verse 9, all of that for this purpose, that the church, that the church. And you're, that, you're the church. It's not your neighbor. What are you doing? What are you praying? Lord, I need help. Bless me, Lord. You got to get past that at some point in your life. You know, I, I had an interesting time this morning. I was, <clears throat> no, I'm going to get in trouble for this, waiting on Becky. <laughs> Actually, she was on time. I was early. Just, okay. So I'm, I'm just praying. I'm, I'm in, walking in the kitchen and in the, in the living room, and I'm just praying. And I looked out, and I saw one of my neighbors down the street out in his backyard. So obviously he wasn't going to church, okay? And, 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 and I know his family, and his family heritage is church. And I, I tell you, 
I, I, I wasn't praying for you. I was praying for him and his family. That God would restore them back to what, what he has for them. And that heritage would come alive in them and in their children and in their grandchildren. And, 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 and just started praying for them. Not bragging on me. I'm just telling you. Sometimes you just got to get out of yourself. See something else. See somebody else. See something different. And I promise you, if you ask the Holy Spirit, He'll show you. So verse 10, it's the church. Okay, listen to what the Amplified Bible says in verse 11. This is in accordance with the, etern the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose. What, what I just told you is in accordance with the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose which he, God, has realized and carried into effect in the person of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Set up. We're set up for the end. We're set up for the end time. We're set up. <laughs> to see God do something great. To see God do something powerful. One more scripture and I'll finish. Listen to this. Romans chapter 16, verse 25 in the Amplified Bible. It, it just hooks up with this. Listen to this. Now to him who is able to strengthen you in the faith. This is what I'm praying for you. Which is in accordance with my gospel, Paul said. And the preaching of Jesus Christ. The Messiah, according to the revelation, the unveiling of the mystery of the plan of redemption, which was kept in silence and secret for long ages, but is, you ready? But is now disclosed and through the prophetic scripture is made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. Now here's, listen to this. For what purpose? To win them to obedience to the faith. That's where it comes down to, right there. All of this is so that we can win them. Who? Whoever them is in your life. To the obedience of the faith. Win them to the Lord. Let that soul come alive unto God. That's what we're after. But that's not, the, that's not the product of a church program, folks. That's a product of you being the church. That's a product of me being the church outside of being the pastor, <coughs> just being the church. And you've got to make up your mind, you're going to step up to the plate. Because I, I, I know this sounds kind of funny, but God doesn't have anybody else. He doesn't have a secret army hidden away. You're it. And he's depending on you. He's depending on me. We've got to make up our minds. We're going to be the church. We're going to be the church and see God do something. The sad part about it is I hear this all that Well, you know, God's got a remnant. I don't want a remnant. I want the whole cloth. I want God to use everybody in a powerful way. That includes you. And He will. All you've got to do is be available. That's the secret that's been unveiled. We've got it. All we've got to do is let God use us to represent Him. You'd be amazed at what can happen. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Before we're dismissed today, <coughs> I want to give you an opportunity. We have some people moving around. They're serving, so don't be distracted by that. But while your head's bowed and your eyes closed, just examine your own self. Where are you? Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life or have you just been going to church? Are you really serving and living for Him or are you just kind of living the life hoping you're going to make it in? 
I got good news for you today. God's about to do something great. I don't want you to miss out on it. And I'm not talking about the return of Jesus, the rapture of the church. I'm talking about God's going to do something great. But you've got to be ready. You've got to be open. If your heart's not ready, it's just like the ten virgins. Ten, five of them weren't ready. I want to be ready. I want you to be ready. So if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or maybe you've been away from the Lord, today is your day to get things back on track. And so if that's you today, I'm going to do something. I'm simply right where you're seated, but, but I need an act of faith from you. If you say, that's me, I've never made Jesus my Lord, or I've been away, or I haven't been serving God like I know I need to, pray for me. As an act of your faith right now, just lift your hand up. Say, pray for me. Thank you. You can put it back down. Just lift it up where I can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm looking. Now, I'm not doing this so you can soothe your conscience and feel better when you leave church today. I'm looking for commitment. Not, not for me, but for the Lord. Now, if you would, let's just pray this prayer together, everyone. Say, Father, thank you that you're fulfilling your plans through me, through the church. I want to be ready. I want to be available. And I choose Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior. I choose to walk with Him, live for Him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.